here to talk about the Wright brothers. Uh, these two guys, um, Orville's the one on your left with the mustache. Wilbur's the one on your right with less hair than Orville. Wilbur was uh, four years, about four years, almost four years older than uh, his brother Orville. Um, they both of them were the sons of um, a minister, a bishop actually, in the Church of the United Brethren in Christ. And uh, so they grew up in a very um, tight family. They were close brothers. Uh, can we have the next one? Next slide. Zip. There we go. Um, as you can see, everybody thinks there are two Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orville. Well, there are actually four Wright brothers. Uh, Ruchlin, whom you can see on the left of the screen, again, born in 1861, was their oldest brother. And uh, Lauren, born the next year, you can see, uh, 1862, was their second oldest brother. And then Wilbur and Orville, they were actually um, a set of twins who died in infancy between um, Wilbur, the older brother, and Orville, the younger brother. And then you can see on your right a picture of Catherine Wright, Catherine Wright Pascal, uh, her married name. She married uh, quite late in life. So uh, four boys, one girl, uh, and that was the, uh, the Wright family, the children of Bishop Milton and uh, Susan Catherine Corner Wright. Um, so there they are. Again, they're a very close family. Bishop Wright um, taught his children um, that the world was uh, not a particularly friendly place. And that um, in the end, family was really what was important. They had to depend on one another. And as a result, they were an incredibly uh, close family, all five of them. Next. Next slide. Here's a picture of the two of them. Um, Wilbur now is on the left and Orville's on the right. Wilbur, when this picture was taken, was about 11. Orville, when his picture was taken, was um, about seven. And that year, their father, again, was a bishop in the church, and he traveled a lot. He was actually the bishop in the United Brethren in Christ Church, who was responsible for the West Coast. So he was gone from home a lot. Uh, but being a good father, um, he wrote these great letters to all of his children, letting them know what he was seeing and uh, saw, you know, legends of a sea serpent when he was in San Diego. And when he would come home, he would always bring presents for them, really thoughtful presents. And the thing that you see in the middle of the screen between Will and Orv is a little helicopter toy that he brought home in 1881 for them. The thing that you see on the top that looks like two wings, they're actually the propellers of a helicopter. You, um, you can see below it the rubber strands there and the bow, which kind of helps hold things together. And uh, you twirl the um, propeller on top and let it go and the thing will bounce up against the, uh, the ceiling. These little helicopter toys are really quite old. Uh, the earliest versions probably pop up in ancient China. And uh, you see versions of them too in medieval and early modern Europe. But it's in the 19th century uh, that this little toy really becomes pretty important. Um, the, the person whom we can regard as the world's first aeronautical engineer, Sir George Cayley, who was an English baronet who began his aeronautical experiments just at the end of the 18th, early 19th century. 
And he began his career by designing a special version of a little helicopter toy. Uh, there was a, an 18th century version that um, really people paid a lot of attention to. And all during the 19th century, this little toy um, would sort of inspire one generation of flying machine enthusiasts after another. Sir George Cayley inspired at the very beginning of the century, Wilbur and Orville Wright inspired by it at the very end of the century. So um, a couple of lessons, I guess. Uh, parents bringing really thoughtful educational presence home for their children that can have a huge impact. And the other lesson is that, you know, when we think about toys, we think about them being just little things that you play with and go on to something else. But in fact, some toys, like the little helicopter, just had a huge influence. In later years, after they became famous for inventing the airplane, people would ask the Wright brothers how it had all began for them. And they would always tell the story of their father bringing them the little helicopter toy. And they continued to fiddle with this thing really through, the, through their lives. Um, at, when they were world famous people uh, in the early years of the 20th century, famous as the inventors of the airplane, they were still building little toys like this for their nieces and nephews. Neither Wilbur nor Orville ever married, so they didn't have any children. But they would send these little helicopter toys that they built for their nieces and nephews into the air, and the kids would run all over the lawn chasing them. And so Wilbur and Orville really understood how important this toy was for them. As they grew older, um, neither of the boys, go ahead, next slide. Neither of the boys went to uh, college, um, but they were always really excited about learning. And their father had a great library. So they learned uh, mathematics and engineering principles and that kind of thing sort of uh, on their own as they were growing up. In the late 19th, early 20th century, um, not a lot of engineers were college graduates anyway. Um, a great many of them sort of learned engineering by taking a first low level engineering job and kind of working their way up <clears throat> and learning the tools of the trade, mathematics and so on, as uh, as they moved up in the profession. And that's kind of the way it was with the Wright brothers. They were always fascinated by machines, by mechanics. Um, the first um, thing that the two of them really did together in an important way was to start a print shop at their home in Dayton, Ohio. Um, Orville was born in Dayton. Wilbur had actually been born just across the state line in uh, Richmond, uh, Indiana. But um, as the boys uh, grew older, looking for a business, they went into business together, uh, again, operating a print shop. And uh, they not only printed uh, local little newspapers and, and did job printing and that kind of thing, they also built the occasional printing press uh, Orville especially became sort of famous uh, locally among printers for uh, a printing press that he had made actually using a tombstone as the bed of the press and putting the rest of it together by himself. Well, in the 1890s, the bicycle craze swept across the United States and the Wright brothers actually hired someone, one of their friends, to run the print shop and they began building and selling uh, bicycles, repairing them first. And uh, ultimately they began building their own brands of bicycles. Not nothing like a factory here. They would build them sort of one at a time uh, by hand, but um, that taught them um, simple machine skills 
and uh, metalworking skills, welding, that that kind of thing. So it was uh, it was quite important for them uh, to be in the bicycle business. <coughs> they were never, <coughs> excuse me. They were never big time bike manufacturers. Again, they built them one at a time and sold them. <coughs> so there you go. The Wrights had always been sort of fascinated by flight. Um, as very young men <laughs> reading in their father's library, they had found a couple of books on bird flight and that kind of thing. They had followed the work of a German glider pioneer named Otto Lilienthal, and were very excited by him, <coughs> as were a great many other people. Uh, Lilienthal was really, uh, Sir George Cayley, the Englishman we talked about at the beginning of the century, had actually built gliders, uh, two of which were capable of carrying people into the air. And uh, other people had continued to experiment as the century went on. And by the time you got to the 1880s and the 1890s, this fellow, Otto Lilienthal, had begun, had um, done experiments, uh, developed uh, his own sort of wing theory, and uh, wrote a book on the, his theories of flight and then put all of that to work by building gliders beginning in the 1890s. <clears throat> and by 1896, he had made over 2,000 flights and he was world famous. Uh, <coughs> people had taken pictures ah, of uh, Lilienthal gliding down hills and uh, so he had appeared in newspapers, stories about him in newspapers, literally all over the world. And he was really famous as the flying man. And Wilburn Orville in little old Dayton, Ohio, paid attention to those articles and followed Lilienthal's career. Well, in August of 1896, Lilienthal was killed in a glider crash. And uh, that summer, it, it happened in the summer, Orville Wright had come down with a bad case of typhoid fever, which was a very serious illness. And Wilbur would sit by his bed and sort of mop his brow and read the newspaper to him. And Wilbur later said that it was at that time, while he was sitting there reading to his brother, that he ran across an article um, about the death of um, Otto Lilienthal. Uh, well, okay. Um, I had a minor technical glitch on my part here, but it won't won't bother you guys. So anyway, inspired by Lilienthal, the Wright brothers um, began to think about the problem of flight and wondered if uh, they couldn't sort of pitch in and see what they could contribute now that the great Lilienthal was dead. And so by 1899, they were ready to start. And what you see on the screen is um, a kite, a wing warping kite, wingspans about five feet that um, Wilbur built in the bike shop in uh, 1899. And the special thing about the kite was that you could, by holding two sticks on the ground, the way you see uh, me doing down there in the photograph, and by manipulating the sticks, you could actually twist the wings. And if you look at the drawing, uh, this is a drawing that Wilbur had uh, prepared. Uh, for a patent suit in 1912. But you can see how when you twist those sticks down there, down here, are being held by the hand. And when you twist them like that, you actually warp the wing, uh, controlling the thing in the air. 
Um, you know, as the Wright brothers thought about the problems of flight, it seemed to them correctly that there were three basic problems that uh, had to be solved to create an airplane. Uh, one, uh, you had to be able to build wings that would lift you off the ground. Two, you had to have a propulsion, a power source that would move you forward so that the air would flow over the wings and they'd lift. And three, you had to have a way to control the machine once you were in the air. Lilienthal had been killed because he couldn't control his machine. And another Englishman, a fellow named Percy Pilcher, same, <laughs> same thing, had been killed uh, in a glider accident when uh, he couldn't fully control his, his machine. So when the Wright brothers went into the airplane business, uh, the first thing they did was to think about those three problems that had to be solved. Wings, well, Lilienthal had built wings that were capable of carrying him through the air, and other people had too. Uh, Samuel Langley had been flying little steam-powered airplanes, aerodromes, he called them, and other people had actually gotten off the ground with wings. So the Wright brothers figured, well, uh, we can take what other people have learned about wings, for now anyway, and push ahead that way. So we'll accept what other people say about wings. Propulsion? Well, we're going to build gliders like Lilienthal and Percy Pilcher. And uh, that means, in essence, um, gravity will be our propulsion system. We're going to fly downhill. So that left control, and control was the one issue that nobody had wrestled very successfully with. And again, the fact that they couldn't control their machines in the air had killed some experimenters. So the Wrights thought, okay, first thing we do, figure out how to control the machine in the air. And that's the role that the little wing warping kite in 1899 uh, played in their careers. They um, were able to maneuver the kite and thought, well, okay, um, so we'll forge ahead. Next picture, next slide. Now, the first, the Wright brothers were in fact, um, engineers of genius, intuitive engineers of genius. Again, they didn't have college educations, but they had this innate capacity to solve difficult technical issues. And they knew that um, one, of the, one of the tools that they had was mathematics. So the Wright brothers were gonna calculate everything that they could possibly calculate. And when they designed their first glider, um, they did it on paper. They used an, an algebraic formula that Lilienthal had developed, and they used Lilienthal's data to plug into it. And when they did that, they discovered that um, living in Dayton, Ohio, with very little wind uh, that they could count on, they were either going to have to build a humongous glider with huge wings to generate enough lift to get the glider and a pilot off the ground, or they were going to have to fly into a pretty good headwind. If you're flying forward into the wind, your airspeed is a combination of your own speed moving forward and the speed of the wind moving toward you. So, they became interested in windy places in the United States. They wrote to the Weather Bureau. The Weather Bureau sent um, information back to them about windy places in America. And it turned out that, as you might suspect, the windiest places in America were sort of cities on the edge of lakes or bodies of water. Uh, Chicago, for example. Uh, Buffalo, New York, San Francisco, California, San Diego. Uh, but the Wright brothers 
didn't want to fly someplace close to a city. Um, they wanted to conduct their experiments sort of in private. And when they were ready to let people know what they had done, they would let people know what they had done. So um, as they went down the list of windy places that the Weather Bureau had sent them, they ran across this little place called Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, uh, which is on the Atlantic Ocean and which does have strong, steady headwinds. So they wrote a letter to the postman, or well, actually the guy who was in charge of weather, uh, the weather, little weather station at Kitty Hawk, a fellow named Joe Dosher. And uh, Dosher turned the letter over to sort of the local political boss, William Tate, whose wife was the postmistress of this little fishing village of Kitty Hawk on the coast and uh, who was sort of the, the uh, big political figure in Kitty Hawk. And Tate wrote back to the Wright brothers saying, yeah, we have a strong steady wind here. And uh, we have these tall sand dunes that you could uh, fly off of. And if you hit the ground, you'd have sand, it wouldn't be all that hard. And uh, I can tell you one thing, if you come down here with your scientific kite flying experiments, you will find friendly people who will help you in any way that they can. And I've always thought that that's, that closing thing about friendly people is what won the Wright brothers over. Now, the Wright brothers were not great world travelers. They'd gone to the, the uh, Columbian Exposition in Chicago, but they hadn't done a lot of traveling. Now, they were gonna have to travel with their first glider all the way from Dayton, Ohio, to the coast. And you can see in this slide uh, a map of the trip that uh, they had to make. With train changes and uh, all of that, they wound up in a city called Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And there were no regular um, ships taking people over to the Outer Banks, to Kitty Hawk. So uh, Wilbur, who kind of pioneered and went down to Kitty Hawk first, uh, had to ask around and find somebody with a boat who was willing to take him across to the Outer Banks. And uh, it wasn't much of a boat. They were caught in a terrible storm. And uh, Wilbur was just darn glad to get ashore in this little town of Kitty Hawk when, when he actually arrived. Next slide. So when they got down there and Wilbur immediately sent a telegram to Orville saying, well, it's like they said it was, there's plenty of wind and sand and come on down. They had shipped most of the glider, prefabbed it in Dayton and shipped it down, uh, except for the long spars that they needed uh, for the wings. And um, so they actually assembled their first 1900 glider when um, when they got down there. And I guess we didn't have a picture of the 19 1900 glider. Um, but here's the next one, the, the 1901. The, the point being that um, when they actually got down there with the glider, and again, they'd done the mathematics and um, knew how much lift the thing was supposed to generate, well, when they got there, it didn't generate as much lift as calculated. It was about 20% short. So in 1900, their first year at Kitty Hawk, they could really only fly their little kite the way you see them doing in this 1901 picture from the next year, flying it as a kite. And um, I suppose when the Wrights discovered that it was so small, it really couldn't support their weight very well. Although Wilbur did make um, one day's worth of kind of mini flights in 1900. Mostly the glider just didn't produce the lift required to take somebody through the air. And I think a lot of people would have thrown it into the sand and gone fishing. And the Wrights loved fishing at Kitty Hawk. But being the Wright brothers, they didn't. What they did do, was to fly it as a kite, as you see it here. 
And they're not just flying it as a kite. The thing is attached to a fish scale so that they can measure the total amount of force on that machine when it's being flown as a kite. They have a way, they have something called an anemometer to measure the wind speed, and they have a way to measure the angle of attack that the glider's flying at. And with that information in hand, they could sort of back calculate, and that's how they discovered that they were only getting about 20%. They were getting about 20% less lift than what their original calculations had uh, um, suggested they should get. So back they go to Dayton, and their solution to the problem was the obvious one. They built the 1901 glider, which you see in this picture, which was about twice as big as the 1900 glider. And while it was still producing less lift than calculated, because it was bigger, they could begin to make real flights with it. And uh, in fact, Wilbur made all of the flights in. Uh, 1901. Can you see, can we see the next slide? Here's a picture of um, Wilbur being launched uh, down the hill. And uh, as you saw on that last slide, in 1901, uh, they made 50 to 100 glides. And uh, as you can see, the thing actually um, got into the air. Next slide. Here's a picture of, again, Wilbur flying the thing, and you can see he's in the air, but there was a real problem. What they had discovered was that not only did their wings not perform as advertised, but the wing warping system something was wrong with it. And every once in a while, Wilbur would be flying along like this and he would spin into the ground. Uh, the reason for that is because when you warp the wings, you warp, say, the right wing up and the left wing down, then yes, you're increasing the amount of lift on the right wing but you're also increasing the amount of drag, the air resistance, because you've tilted the edge of the wing up. And what that means is that instead of the wing raising and, and turning the way it's supposed to, it's gonna do the opposite. It's gonna go backwards and put you in uh, a spin, which is a very dangerous thing. And Wilbur, was frankly frightened uh, because the behavior of the machine was just not predictable. Next slide. Next slide. There we go. This, um, which kind of looks like the Sahara Desert down there, is actually a picture that Wilbur and Orville took from the top of the big Kill Devil Hill, uh, where the big monument to the Wright brothers is today. And it's looking down the hill at the camp, and you can see that X marks the spot down there. That's where their, their uh, camp was, 1901, two, and three. And uh, so those of you who know Kitty Hawk know that it's, it has a lot of trees and green stuff, and it doesn't really look this desolate anymore. Uh, that's because uh, over the years, the National Park Service and other people have planted um, trees and grass and so on down there. So uh, now it, it actually no longer looks as sandy and, and desolate as it did then. Somebody once asked Wilbur what Kitty Hawk was like and uh, when they were there. And his answer was, well, it's, it was like the Sahara or the Sahara as I imagine it to have been. Next slide. And of course, when they were there, uh, they lived in a camp initially in a tent with a kind of primitive building for the glider. Um, 
And then finally, they had a second building for themselves and the original hangar for the glider. And what you're looking at here is a picture taken in uh, September 1902. And you can see the remains of the old glider over here and uh, Wilbur's cooking or, or something. Um, when they were at Kitty Hawk, Orville would write a lot of letters home to his sister, Kate. Um, he was very close to, to Kate. And they're wonderful letters. Um, he told her about their flying machine experiments, but he also told her about what life was like at Kitty Hawk, about the storms and their tent being blown over and um, uh, mosquitoes as big as birds and, and um, the difficulties of, of life at, uh, at Kitty Hawk. Go ahead, next slide. Over the winter, of 1901, 1902. Remember, Wilbur was really worried about the performance of the 1901 glider, about the fact that it wasn't behaving as it was supposed to. So they went home to Dayton, and um, an engineering friend of theirs, Octave Chanute, had invited Wilbur to come to Chicago and give a talk about their flying machine experiments to date. And Orville stayed back in Dayton. And as he was back in Dayton and began to think about their problems, one problem clearly was the fact that their lift wasn't what they calculated it should be. And to solve that problem, they built a wind tunnel. Uh, now, a wind tunnel um, enables you to test small wings. And over basically November, December, 1901, the Wright brothers tested a whole series of wings and got lift and, and uh, drag data uh, from their two wind tunnel balances. And what that enabled them to do was to throw the Lilienthal data that they had been using out, they just threw it out, and they substituted the data they had collected themselves now from their wind tunnel. So their wing lift was finally gonna match their mathematical predictions because now they were using data that they had gathered themselves and trusted. But the other problem had been with the control system uh, because of the spinning, the well digging as Wilbur called it. Their solution to that you can see in this picture of their 1902 glider being launched downhill. And that's the tail that's on the back of the glider now, a rudder. Um, and uh, originally the rudder was fixed, but very quickly they made it movable so that uh, the rudder would always sweep toward the wing that was um, warped up and that would prevent the airplane from control reversal and going into a spin and that uh, would enable them to keep flying in a, a straight line, which is really straight line flying as all the Wright brothers were gonna do um, on purpose anyway, uh, from now through 1903. But uh, those two changes, the new wing data and the application of a movable rudder enabled the rights to, to make the last of their breakthroughs. Next slide. Here you can see, again, the 1902 glider in the air. You can see how pretty it is compared to the stubbier wings of um, the 1901 glider. Next slide. And this is a really good picture if you look really closely, you can see that the wings are actually warped on this one, in this picture. Um, the, the machine is falling off to the right, so Wilbur or Orville, I forget who that is, has warped the right wing up, and that's going to bring it back up so that he'll continue uh, flying in a straight line. So, in 1902, the brothers flew time after time after time. 
without serious accident, really. And so they were sure now that they were close to final success. They were going to have to put an engine on the thing. And uh, over the winter of 1902 and into early 1903, next slide, they built the 1903 Wright Flyer, the world's first powered, controlled, sustained airplane. And uh, you can see this picture, as it says, taken on the morning of December 17th, 1903, about 10.35 a.m. And uh, you can see that the airplane is just lifted off the rail. If you look underneath the airplane and going back to the left, that line is a monorail track. The Wright brothers are flying in sand at Kitty Hawk, and uh, so they can't put wheels on the airplane. It would sink into the sand. So they decided to use a, uh, a single monorail track, and the airplane ran down it and into the air. And on that morning, uh, they made a total of four flights. Next slide. And here are three of those four flights. Let me turn my page, there we go. And uh, you can see that each flight was longer than the one before it. And if you look at the dotted line, that's the fourth flight. And it ends 852 feet down the beach. The airplane stayed in the air for 59 seconds, almost a full minute. And since they're flying into a really heavy headwind, um, 25, 26, 27 miles an hour, then their distance through the air is actually much farther than uh, 852 feet. Far enough to convince the brothers that, um, well, they still had a lot of work to do. They had the basic problems of lift, propulsion, and control uh, in hand. And uh, so the world's first flights, four of them, the morning of December 17th, 1903. At the end of the fourth flight, they actually carried the airplane back to the shed and it was cold. So they uh, left one guy, in fact, he was the fellow who took the famous first flight photo outside to hold the airplane down in the wind. And everybody else went into the shed to warm their hands on the stove. And a gust of wind came along and flipped the airplane and the guy who was holding it uh, backwards. And uh, he was okay, but the airplane wasn't. It was uh, pretty badly damaged. So those four flights on the morning of December 17th, were the, that was the entire aeronautical history of the world's first airplane. They um, boxed everything up, shipped it back to Dayton, and they were back in Dayton in time for Christmas, 1903. Um, um, quick question. Um, yeah. So who, the first person to ever fly was actually um, Orville. Um, for the second, third, fourth flight, who was the fourth person flying? So did the brothers take turns? They did. Orville was the first. They had actually made a test three days before on December 17th. And uh, they flipped a coin that day and Wilbur won or lost as it turned out. They laid foolishly, they laid, and they didn't make many foolish mistakes, but they did on the 14th. They laid the track down the lower slope of Kitty Hawk, the big Kitty Hawk Hill. And um, unfortunately what that meant was that the airplane was hard to release because of the way they started it. And when they did get it released, it just zipped down the rail and into the air and it caught Wilbur by surprise and he came down too hard and uh, kind of broke the forward elevator. And it took him three days to make the repairs and wait for good weather again. Uh, and of course that was the morning of the 17th. And since Wilbur had tried and failed, it was Orville's turn. So he made that first successful flight. Then the second flight that morning was Wilbur, the third Orville, 
and the fourth, the really long flight that convinced them they had achieved sustained flight was Wilbur. So they go, oh, so they go um, back to Dayton and Christmas after the four flights of December 17th. And they figure they've been wasting a lot of money going down to Kitty Hawk. And uh, next slide, I'm sorry. Uh, so they would try to find a place closer to home. And the place they found was a cow pasture about eight miles east of Dayton, owned by a guy named Torrance Huffman. And uh, for that reason, it was called Huffman Prairie. And they set to work there in the early spring of 1904. And I think they probably expected to pick up where they left off at Kitty Hawk. Problem was Dayton doesn't have the kind of steady headwinds that Kitty Hawk had. So it takes them well into the summer uh, to really get up and going. And uh, the picture that you see on the screen, as you can see, was actually the 46th flight um, in the next year. Ah, oh, you didn't keep a, okay. Um, in 1904, um, they got to the point where they could fly a circle for the first time. And uh, so the next year, 1905, they, they, the world still didn't know much about the Wright brothers. And those who did know about the Wright brothers didn't really believe that they had achieved very much. So when they're flying at Huffington Prairie in 1904 and 1905, they don't have anybody bothering them really. And it's in 1904, then they built another machine in 1905. That's the one you see on the screen. And the picture that you see is, um, again, their 46th flight. It's uh, Orville Wright, 33 minutes, 20 seconds, 20.8 miles. By the fall of 1905, in other words, they've taken that first successful airplane, the Kitty Hawk airplane, and turned it into a practical flying machine. The Kitty Hawk airplane was really pretty marginal. It, it achieved successful, sustained, controlled, powered flight. But it really isn't until the fall of 1905 that the Wright brothers have a real airplane, a product ready for sale, that'll go up and stay up as long as the gas holds out and do basically what the pilot wants it to do. Next slide. Next slide. This one uh, took the Wright brothers a couple of years after 1905 to convince the world that they could do what they claimed to do. And it's in uh, the spring and summer of 1908 that they really spring their airplane on the world. Um, Orville flies at Fort Myer, Virginia, and that's Orville flying in this picture in uh, 1908. Wilbur is in France uh, demonstrating the airplane for uh, a European syndicate that's going to buy it. Next slide. And um, Orville actually suffered a crash at Fort Myer that uh, was not a fault of the airplane. So the government said, that's okay, come back and finish your demonstration when you can. But uh, Orville and Kate, and uh, you can see them in this picture, Kate in the hat, and uh, the person standing next to Kate is uh, King Alfonso. Uh, I think it's Alfonso of Spain. I'd actually have to look at my own notes. But at any rate, in Europe, uh, when Orville and Kate joined Wilbur, they were um, the toast of the continent. Uh, these middle Americans um, who had come out of nowhere and achieved what no one had been able to achieve before them uh, just stunned the world and became great among the first great celebrities, the first great really famous figures of the 20th century. 
Next slide. This is a picture taken at the White House in 1909, as you can see. And the big fellow in the center of the picture is William Howard Taft, the President of the United States. And standing to um, his left, no, I guess it's his right, your left, is Wilbur Wright. And standing on the other side is Orville Wright. And next to Orville is Kate, Catherine Wright, in that great hat. This is the day when the Wright brothers were presented with a gold medal uh, for their achievements as the inventors of the airplane and people who had brought um, great um, fame and prestige to the United States. Next slide. And this, the last slide, is uh, from the patent that the Wright brothers were granted. They uh, applied for it, uh, but it wasn't granted actually until uh, 1906. And uh, this is the page of the patent application that demonstrates how wing warping works. Uh, you can see the little dotted line uh, on the right and left that shows how the wing can change angles. So that's the Wright brothers um, and the story of the invention of the airplane. When you tell the story of the Wright brothers, one of the things that um, bothers me a little is that uh, it's easy to make it sound as though these guys were two lucky bicycle makers who just kind of struck it rich. And nothing could be farther from the truth. As I said earlier, Wilbur and Orville were intuitive engineers of, of genius um, who did what no one else had been able to do. And in so doing, forever changed the history of the world. Um, lots of inventions from the early 20th century changed the world, but few of them, I think, changed the world more than the airplane. It changed everything from the way in which uh, we travel and transport goods to the way in which uh, we make war. And if you think about it, um, it was um, a great moment psychologically in world history, too. Um, I have a friend who won the Pulitzer Prize with a book on space flight in which he argued that um, in the, the uh, late 50s and early 60s, when human beings first began to go into space, that was um, an almost moment of evolutionary change. It almost is big enough to change us as a species, for heaven's sakes. To which I reply, well, yeah, I think flight did change us psychologically to that extent, but I don't think the change occurred in the space age. I think it occurred, occurred with Wilbur Norville Wright and the invention of the airplane. Um, I mean, people had been waiting for millennia to see human beings fly. And all of a sudden there it was. Uh, people were leaving the ground in this heavier than air machine that they had constructed their own minds, their own hands. And um, it just seemed to, it blew people away. It, it is as though it opened a new door on the 20th century. Uh, before Wilbur and Orville Wright, you honestly could hear people say, gosh, if God had wanted us to fly, he would have given us wings. After Wilbur and Orville, you heard people saying things like, wow, if we, flesh and blood human beings can actually achieve that. We can build a big heavy machine that'll carry us into the air. What can't we accomplish? And again, it was as though a new door of possibility was, uh, was opening on, on the new century. So that's what I have. Any questions? Yeah, actually, that, that was a profound statement. It's always great hearing from you, Dom. Um, one of the first questions that we had was the airplane patented or just the wing warping, or was it both? Uh, no, I'm sorry, Jenny, again. 
Oh, um, in terms of the patent, was it the patent for the plane, for the wing warping, or was it both? Well, um, the Wright brothers, it, at the heart of the patent, it's about control, not just wing warping, but the way in which um, wing warping, lateral control, works together with the rudder, the movable tail, and the elevator uh, out in front of the pilot. So what the patent really shows you, is they're, what they're really patenting is their control system. <clears throat> the um, data that they had gathered, for example, with the wind tunnel, you can't patent that kind of thing. So the Wright brothers decided, or their patent, they had a really good patent lawyer, uh, a fellow named Harry Toolman from Springfield, Ohio, just down the road from Dayton, um, advised that the thing to do was essentially to patent the control system, because that would be the bottleneck. Nobody was nobody else was going to be able to fly like the Wright brothers until they could control their airplane like the Wright brothers. So the Wrights patented their control system. Um, not just wing warping, the courts would later rule that um, other kinds of lateral control, including what we now call ailerons, uh, were covered by the Wright patent as well. So specific to the patent, um, were there any other people trying to find, trying to get a patent at the same time, or what was the Wright brothers' role with patents? Well, at the time the Wright brothers succeeded, the world was full of people who had been trying to fly and were trying to fly. Um, in fact, uh, today, while most of us agree that Wilbur and Orville Wright invented the airplane and launched the air age, there are lots of other people in the world who would argue that somebody else did that. If uh, you were born in Brazil, chances are you might believe that a fellow named Alberto Santos Dumont was the first guy to fly. Um, if you were a New Zealander, uh, you might believe that a fellow named Richard Purse got into the air before the Wrights. Um, and there are others as well. Uh, but when you look at all of those other first flight claims, the claims of people who, who say they flew before the Wrights, um, they fall apart. And uh, what we're left with is the Wrights as um, the geniuses who invented the airplane. And then specific to sort of the genius of them, I had heard a story that they were really good at the secrecy element and that one of the reasons that there was aluminum um, sort of dust on the wood, the materials that they used for the right flyer were wood and cloth to create it. Um, is it true that they actually preserved it with that aluminum sort of to create some secrecy in terms of what the materials actually were? Yeah, it, what uh, Jeannie's talking about is the fact that the, the exposed wooden parts of um, airplane, the Wright airplanes after 1903 um, were in fact uh, painted with a kind of uh, varnish that had aluminum dust uh, suspended in it. And uh, that's why uh, when you look at Wright airplanes uh, in museums, sometimes you think that those struts uh, separating the wings are made out of metal. Uh, but they're not. Uh, again, it's just aluminum paint, essentially. Um, there are people, yeah, I mean, certainly the Wright brothers were intent on um, maintaining sort of um, their basic ideas until they had gotten the patent and until they had signed some contracts. Um, for people who are going to pay them to, to build airplanes. And uh, so in that sense, yeah, they were secretive. Whether or not um, the uh, um, aluminum uh, in, in the varnish was to make it uh, more difficult for photographers to see what was going on or not, hard to say. Uh, it may just have been to preserve the wood.
That makes sense. And in terms of preservation, we had a question about which parts of the flyer on display, on display at the mall um, are original to the 1903 flyer. I know that people have some questions sort of about that specific artifact, and I wondered how you would um, re sort of say, is it the real thing? How would you res respond to that? Yeah, it's the real thing. Um, it's the real thing the way the inventor of the airplane, Orville Wright, wanted you to see the, the real thing. On December 17th, as we said, the, the airplane was blown over backwards uh, by the wind, and a lot of damage was done to it. All of the little, because it was blown over backwards, so it was resting on the trailing edge of the wing, all the wing tips were broken off. And the engine, which is also cast aluminum, had these thin little feet uh, that attached it to the airplane, and they broke. So the engine came halfway down, hit the frozen sand, and actually the crankcase of the engine shattered. And of course, it took the transmission, uh, the tubes with the uh, uh, chains to drive the propellers and all that, they came with it. So almost all of that um, was really badly damaged. Um, they shipped the airplane home to Dayton, and it actually stayed in the crates and barrels uh, that it had been shipped home in uh, for over 10 years. It went through the great 1913 flood in the crates and barrels in which it had come back from Kitty Hawk. And um, in 1916, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology which was moving from Boston proper to Cambridge, had just opened their famous building, the Institute building, the one with the dome. And the founding fathers of MIT had asked Orville Wright, Wilbur uh, had died of typhoid fever in 1912. So the MIT guys asked uh, Orville if they could exhibit the world's first airplane. And Orville said, sure. And it was then that he took it out of the crates and barrels and with his workmen um, reassembled it. And again, things like the trailing edge tips of the wing ribs, those all had to be replaced. Um, the engine, he had all of the parts of the engine and could repair the transmission and all that, except the crankcase which again had shattered when it hit the frozen sand. So, and uh, the crankshaft, the part that attached to the propellers and drove them, that had actually been stolen from an exhibit in New York City in 1906. So Orville had to take the crankshaft and the crankcase from the engine that powered the 1905 airplane, the world's first practical airplane, and he put those into the 1903 uh, engine. And so when the airplane went on display again at MIT that year, um, it had uh, some wooden repairs like those wing tips and so on. Uh, the engine, had, as I said, the crankcase and shaft from the 1905 engine. But essentially, it was the original 1903 airplane, uh, just sort of repaired, if you will, after the crash. And as I said at the beginning, what I always tell people is that the airplane that they're seeing in the Wright Brothers Gallery at the National Air and Space Museum is indeed the world's first airplane. It's the world's first airplane, the way Orville Wright, the inventor of the airplane, wanted you to see it. And um, I don't know, people give various percentages. I think um, it's probably fair to say that um, the airplane that you see in the gallery has 75% of the parts that actually flew on December 17, 1903, at least that much. And um, the material, the repairs that had to be made, 
were only made by Orville Wright, uh, the inventor of the airplane. So yeah, it's a real thing. And then following up on that, uh, there was a question, how did the museum acquire the flyer? That is a long story. <laughs> um, the, at the time the Wright brothers flew, um, one of the other people who was trying to fly, trying to invent the airplane, was a fellow named Samuel Pierpont Langley. And Samuel Langley was the third secretary or head of the Smithsonian Institution. Langley had uh, first flown little steam powered models in 1896. And by 1903, he had a full scale version of his airplane. He called it the Aerodrome. And um, it, he had a pilot to fly it, Charles Matthews Manley, who was his aeronautical assistant. Uh, it had a wonderful internal combustion engine. Um, and he, tried to fly it twice with Manley on board, uh, once in October, once in December, just eight days before the Wright brothers actually flew at Kitty Hawk. Langley tried to fly his aerodrome for the second time and failed. Um, as one reporter noted, it went into the water. He launched it from the Potomac, over the Potomac River like a handful of mortar. Um, it had structural problems. Uh, it had aerodynamic problems. Um, it just wasn't capable of flight, although it had a really great engine. A anyway, in uh, later years, the people who followed Langley uh, tended to want to um, sort of buttress Langley's um, reputation uh, in aeronautics. And they began, one of them, the secretary who followed Langley, began to claim that, okay, so the 1903 Langley Airdrome didn't fly. But if things had just been a little different, if this part hadn't broken or that part hadn't broken, it would have flown. So what they began to say was that the 1903 Langley Airdrome was the first machine capable of flight. They always admitted the Wright brothers had done it first, but they began to claim that Langley had been capable of doing it before the Wrights. And obviously, that, uh, as I said, uh, Wilbur Wright had died in 1912, and uh, so the Smithsonian just drove Orville Wright right through the roof. It just made him incredibly angry. Um, he wrote letters to the Smithsonian. He wrote letters to uh, William Howard Taft, who was no longer president. He was then uh, on the Supreme Court, but uh, as Chief Justice, he was on the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian. He wrote to everybody in sight, trying to get them to admit the truth, which was that um, the 1903 test had not proven that Langley was capable of flight at all. Quite the opposite. And um, it went on and on. And by the late 1920s, Orville Wright finally said, okay, Smithsonian Institution, if you're gonna be that way about it, I am gonna send the 1903 Wright Flyer, the world's first airplane, to London to be exhibited in the New Science Museum in London. And he did. And it stayed there for 20 years. And what he said basically was, okay, there it is. Um, if you ever wanted to come back to America, if you'd ever like to display it at the Smithsonian, you don't have to, to admit that Langley failed, nothing like that. All you have to do is to admit that the 1903 Langley flight tests did not prove that the airplane had been capable of flight. That's all you have to do, and it can come home. Well, it wasn't until World War II that another Smithsonian secretary finally said, um, okay, he wrote an article in which um, he accepted the fact that um, the 
the Langley Airdrome had not been capable of flight. I've left a step out here because it is so complicated. Um, but uh, anyway, it was after the secretary um, admitted that the Langley Airdrome, the test had not proved that it was capable of flight, that um, it, it came home. It was unveiled um, in the Arts and Industries building of the Smithsonian, next to the Smithsonian Castle on December 17th, 1948. The complication in the middle there is that um, in 1914, they actually, the Smithsonian allowed the Langley Airdrome to be rebuilt. And in the rebuilding, the fellow who did it essentially turned the failed 1903 airplane into a marginally successful 1914 machine. And he was able to get it off the, off the water at Lake Keuka. But um, as the Smithsonian finally admitted, those 1914 tests didn't prove that the 1903 airdrome had been capable of flying. So it is a complicated story. But it finally came home again, December 17th, 1948. So I was going to say, that's a wonderful way to wrap it up. Uh, the Wright Flyer is now home at the Smithsonian, and it is our responsibility, thanks to your wonderful help, to tell that story. 